Hello, I am John Vucetich and this is an overview of conservation ethics. Many of the ideas that I'll be sharing with you here were developed in collaboration with Michael Nelson and Jeremy Bruscotter. And I want to begin to describe to you some of the basic elements of ethics as an academic discipline by sharing a series of three basic misperceptions that people people often have about ethics. And the first misperception is that people that is that ethics is telling other people how to behave. This is not the case. Ethics as an academic discipline is much more about understanding how it is that we should behave or understanding the reasons why uh, we should behave in a certain way. And so ethics as an academic discipline will be of greatest value to you for these instances where you're either unsure about what is a right course of action or when you're unsure about the reasons why a certain course of action may or may not be right. Second misperception is that ethics is like sociology. Sociology is a science. As a science, it's interested in describing the world around us, in particular, describing the beliefs that people hold and providing explanations for why it is that people hold those beliefs. However, ethics is a rigorous academic discipline from the humanities. And as such, it is not a science. It's not interested in describing the way the world is. It's interested instead in describing how we ought to behave. Ethics is also a venerable tradition within academics. It's in the Western world, uh, one of the oldest disciplines that there are, and scholars have been studying ethics for more than 2,500 years. So it's a, it's, a, it's a pretty weighty subject as far as academic disciplines go. The third misperception is that ethics is subjective in the sense that you know you can believe whatever it is that you like and I can believe what I like and we're uh, simply allowed to disagree and there's no further analysis required. This is not the case at all. What we'll find out momentarily and explore is the idea that ethics is connected to logic in a, in a much stronger sort of way and we'll, we'll get into that immediately. To do so, I want to remind you of an idea that, uh, that we refer to as an argument. Not argument in the sense of two people fighting with one another, but an argument in the sense of like what we have described here, a collection of uh, premises and a conclusion where the premises are said to be evidence in support of a conclusion, that collection of statements, the premises and the conclusion is called an argument. And here in this example, we have a very simple case of, well, Premise one, all birds have wings, and premise two, robins are birds, and the conclusion is therefore robins have wings. The value of an argument is that it allows us to understand and inspect uh, the reliability or the truth of the conclusion, and we're going to use arguments in ethics in exactly this way. And so we can begin by recognizing ethical arguments. And ethical arguments are simply those arguments where the conclusion can be expressed using the word should or the word ought. In this particular case, we have the conclusion, therefore, you should not drive drunk. Now, one of the rules about ethical arguments is that there is almost always some kind of premise that is of an empirical nature, a premise that is simply a description about the way the world is. And in this case, that would be premise one, drunk driving endangers the lives of other, others. But an ethical argument also has to have at least one premise that is of an ethical nature, a premise that probably has the word should or ought in it, though it can sometimes be expressed a bit differently. But any, in any event, there has to be a premise that expresses some kind of a, of a value. The reason that we will be interested in ethical arguments is because we want to know whether the conclusion is a good idea or not, whether the conclusion is in a sense true, and we'll do that by inspecting the quality of the argument that is used to come to that conclusion. The other thing that we can recognize at this early stage in our overview is that conservation is environmental ethics in action. 
this is the case whether we like it or not. This is the case whether we recognize it or not. This is the case whether we confront it or not. And the reason being is that conservation is all about, well, we should manage these water resources in this way, or we should manage this forest in that way, or we should manage this wildlife population in this way. These are all examples of ethical claims. And this is also at the same time the essence of the nature of conservation. Now one of the powerful aspects of an argument is that the ways of analyzing an argument are well developed and really quite formal. And when we say that we're going to analyze an argument what we want to know is does that argument actually support the conclusion that is stated at the end of the argument. What's so important about argument analysis is that the complete task is really wrapped up with just two questions. The first being, are any of the premises mistaken? And the second question is, does the conclusion follow from the premises? That second question could be expressed in different ways. Another way of saying it basically is, is the logical structure of the argument in good shape? If there are no mistakes in the premises, and if the logic is in good solid shape, then the conclusion we say follows from the premises. Otherwise not, and then there would be uh, something for us to work on, something to be concerned about the reliability of that conclusion. Let me give some examples. And we'll go through just a series of uh, arguments, really simple ones, and illustrate how to analyze them. So premise number one, all mammals give live birth. Premise number two, the platypus does not give live birth. Conclusion, the platypus is not a mammal. Well, you might recognize straight away that the conclusion is a false statement. And if it's a false statement, you might be wondering, well, maybe there's something wrong with the argument above. In this particular case, the logical structure of that argument is fine. If the premises are true, then that conclusion has to be true. But it turns out in this particular case, there is a mistaken premise. Whether you recognized it or not straight off, it turns out premise one is not true. There are a few exceptions, it turns out, and the platypus is one of them. The definition of a mammal is got nothing to do with whether the mammal gives live birth or not. A second example. Premise one, all mammals have four chambered hearts. Premise two, eagles have four chambered hearts. Conclusion, eagles are mammals. Again, we recognize straight away that the conclusion is a false statement. And so we can ask, OK, well, what went wrong in the argument that led us to this particular case? In this case, both premises are true, but it turns out that the logical structure of the argument is faulty. And in that way, we ended up with a conclusion that is a false statement. I would like to offer one more example. Premise one, we should promote economic development. Premise two, child slavery promotes economic development. I'm sure you can already intuit how this is going to go wrong in just a moment here. Conclusion, we should promote child slavery. Let's just imagine that you're the kind of person that thinks that that conclusion is, is sensible. If that's the case, you would look at that argument and probably think, oh, well, yeah, that's, that probably is a pretty good argument to support that conclusion. However, if your intuitions tell you that's not quite right, I'm not so sure that I agree with that conclusion, and then you might be wondering, well, how can I critique uh, this argument to demonstrate that that's a faulty conclusion? Sometimes a good strategy for demonstrating what's wrong with an argument is to ask yourself, I wonder if there's a premise that's missing from the argument. A premise that if I add it in there um, would would reveal a weakness in, in, the, in the conclusion. There is such a missing premise. We can make space for it right here. And that missing premise would be something like this. We should do anything and everything that promotes economic development. In a sense, premise three is really just a specifying of premise number one, just kind of expanding or elaborating on, on it. But I, I, again, I want to kind of focus on this idea of it's a premise that occurred to you, and you think it should be in the argument, and so you plug it in there. And now what we see is that OK, yes, the logical form of this argument is just fine. If premise 1, 2, and 3 are, in fact, all correct, then now I guess I would come to that conclusion. But of course, 
we, it's probably not so difficult to make the case that prem, premise three is false, that we shouldn't do everything and anything that uh, would lead to promoting economic development. There'd be some things that should be prohibited. So the strategy here, and we're going to make use of the strategy uh, in just a short little bit here, is that we asked ourselves, is there a premise that's missing from the argument? Something that's necessary to get to the conclusion. And th then what we ended up discovering is that that missing premise was, in fact, a mistaken premise. In this overview of conservation ethics, I want to make some comparisons between ecology, the discipline that you're familiar with, and ethics, the discipline that we're introducing ourselves to. The first comparison has to do with the tools. You know that in ecology, hypothesis testing and regression are important tools. I want you to think of argument analysis as being an important tool of ethics. In fact, it's probably the most important tool. I want you also to recognize that I could have described to you the very basic nature of regression in about 10 minutes time and in doing so you would think oh yeah that makes pretty good sense looks kind of straightforward but there's no way that you would be proficient at regression after such a short presentation to the ideas and I want you to appreciate that argument analysis is something sim similar while I can kind of outline the basic idea of argument analysis in a few minutes it's just important to know that the details are in fact you know, considerable and a bit complicated. You can become proficient at it, but it you know, would take a little time in practice. I also want to point out that argument analysis has been used in the scholarly literature as it pertains to conservation. Uh, for example, in 2009 in the journal Conservation Biology, my colleague and I, Michael Nelson, published a paper on whether scientists should be advocates or not. And that paper made extensive and explicit uh, use of the, of the idea of argument analysis to make the points that we made in that paper. And also in the Oxford Online Handbooks, uh, the same colleague, Michael Nelson, and I published a paper on the ethics of predator control. Again, we made extensive and explicit reference to argument analysis in order to make our points there. So it it's, uh, really is indeed a, a practical and powerful tool. I would like to apply for us argument analysis to a particular circumstance in conservation. And I'll begin to explain the circumstance now. It involves two species of owl, the barred owl, whose geographic range has been expanding for about the last hundred years. It currently lives in all the places that are marked in orange, but in the early 20th century lived only in the eastern part of the United States, the places that are hatched in orange. The other species of owl is the northern spotted owl. It's an endangered species, primarily threatened by loss of habitat, in particular the loss of old growth forests. As the barred owl's range has expanded, it started to live in the places where the northern spotted owl lives. And this overlap began in about the 1990s and has increased uh, ever since that time. Now, whenever the barred owl and the spotted owl end up living in the same place, the barred owl ends up being the better competitor and drives the northern spotted owl uh, out of that area. And so this has been a serious problem for spotted owls. And folks have been concerned about, from a conservation perspective, what, if anything, could or should be done. What is being considered and being uh, exercised in an experimental manner is this idea of shooting barred owls with shotguns as a way of removing them from places where spotted owls can be found. You won't be surprised to know that that uh, has been associated with some controversy. And this controversy is a special case of, of a broader controversy, and it's the controversy between conservation and animal welfare. And it's this conflict that I want to uh, use as kind of a case study for thinking about argument analysis. I want to continue on with just telling you a little bit more about the nature of the controversy. And some of this can be illustrated uh, by excerpts from an article that had been written by a journalist whose name was Warren Cornwall. article was called There Will Be Blood, uh, published in a uh, conservation uh, journal from the University of Washington. The article states, how many barred owls would you kill to save a spotted owl? One? A hundred? A thousand? The calculus is straightforward for David Wernst, as many as it takes. Now Wernst is a conservation director for a regional 
conservation outfit called Conservation Northwest. And the article goes on to say, he likens owl removal to pulling a weed. I don't see the barred owl as much different from addressing Himalayan blackberry or other domineering species that are impacting our landscape. It was a pretty dramatic statement, really, and you can see how a statement like that might uh, fuel controversy for anyone who thought that this might be a bad idea to kill barred owls for this reason. Now, you could say that, oh, well, this is just a journalist taking advantage of something that somebody said and kind of sensationalizing or exaggerating something. But let me uh, now offer to you an excerpt from a journal article. It comes from the journal Biological Innovations, peer-reviewed journal, very August kind of journal. Uh, the article is about sp spotted owls. And... Um, the excerpt that I'd like to read to you from that article is, is that even among biologists is trepidation or resistance about lethal control efforts. This is as it pertains to, to borrowed owls. These reactions are emotionally understandable but misplaced and do not serve a scientific leadership function for the public. Now, when I read that, I almost jumped out of my skin. Uh, as a scientist, I'm not even allowed, according to these colleagues of mine, to even express trepidation about control of barred owls, lethal control that would be. And uh, and the notion that I would maybe think that it's a bad idea just uh, well, I, doesn't serve a proper role for, for a, a scientist. I want to give one other example. This is a different species involved. This has to do with Channel Islands. Uh, Channel Islands are home to a number of seabird colonies, including the Scripps murrelet, also an endangered species. Like many uh, marine islands, we have introduced black rats to the Channel Islands. The National Park Service, who manages these islands, uh, decided in 2001, a few years back now, that they were going to poison all of the rats in order to help protect the merlets. And this was going to be a big operation just logistically. It would be very conspicuous, involved dropping uh, pesticides from airplanes. And um, and so there was a, a public relations uh, uh, effort associated with this uh, removal of black rats. And the public relations effort, you know, was kind of focused on explaining to people what they were doing and why they were doing it. E eventually, the Park Service was sued, and by an animal welfare group, uh, the, the Park Service won the lawsuit. Black rats are now gone from the Channel Islands. Seabirds are doing better. But in the midst of all that controversy, the Park Service representative to the public on this particular issue once wrote, uh, we didn't think we would have much problem in the media with this project. Who could love a rat? As it turns out, lots of people. When I read that, I was again struck by what could be described as again no less than insensitivity about killing a, another creature. Killing in the name of conservation really is an industry for conservation. We do it a, a great deal. We kill ravens in order to protect endangered species of sage grouse and desert tortoises. We kill lions in the context of trophy hunting to promote their populations. We kill cormorants to protect and conserve fisheries. We kill wolves in order to protect endangered species of caribou. We kill brown-headed cowbirds in order to save endangered species of warblers. We kill seals in order to protect endangered species of salmon. We kill lionfish to protect coral reefs. We kill pythons in order to protect the Everglades in Florida. We do an awful lot of killing in the name of conservation. The hierarchy of life. The notion that life exists at different hierarchical levels it's a very important idea in biology, of course, and it also can help us understand a little bit about the nature of, of ethics. Think about individual organisms. When we care about other individual organisms, in particular animals, and ask how is it that we ought to relate to these other animals, this gives rise to what we could call an animal welfare ethic. Think for a moment about populations, species, ecosystems. We could refer to all of those ideas under just one phrase, and we could call that an, 
we could call those ecological collectives. And when we care about ecological collectives and when we ask questions about what is the right way for us humans to relate to ecological collectives, this gives rise to conservation ethics. Now, throughout the 20th century, we saw two great ethical developments, and they were ethical developments pertaining to the uh, kind of widespread appreciation of animal welfare ethics, as well as the widespread appreciation of a conservation ethic. And what sadly is occurring in the 21st century, or so it seems, is trying to figure out which of those two ethics is going to beat the other one. Because, you see, we have created for ourselves many circumstances throughout the planet where these two values are coming into really strong and severe conflict with one another. And the discourse that surrounds that conflict is typically just one side just screaming animal welfare, animal welfare, animal welfare, and the other side just screaming conservation, conservation, conservation. And there isn't really much clarity or much of a, of a sense of how to navigate through these two values when they compete with one another. And so what I'd like to do is just see if it's possible for us to perform some argument analysis that might offer us some insight. And uh, I will refer to the argument that we're about to build as a nascent argument because we're going to kind of assemble it, just uh, one premise at a time and uh, when we're done it's not going to be a definitive moment it'll be just at some point we'll realize ah yes we've gained some insight and, um, and th that's what we're after when building an argument we start with the conclusion we state it we write it down in this particular case it is appropriate to kill in the name of conservation we it might seem like a strange place to begin the end but it's the, it's the right thing to do when building an argument. And we don't start with this conclusion because we believe it, and we don't start with this conclusion because we disagree with it. We start with the conclusion because we have to know where we're headed, and if we're going to assemble premises, you know, we want to make sure the premises are relevant to the conclusion, and so it simply helps to have the conclusion there. And what our objective is, is uh, to see, is it possible for us to build an argument they would end up supporting that conclusion. And so, well, it would seem like the first relevant premise would be that invasive species threaten ecosystems and native species. That seems fine. It seems relevant. At least at first blush, it seems like a, a, a true statement. The second premise we could add is that this threat can be mitigated by killing invasive species. It also seems relevant and, again, at least at, at first glance, it's like a true premise. The third premise is that ecosystems and native species are valuable and they should be protected. Right away we can appreciate that this argument is an ethical argument and it has all of the parts that we expect to see in an ethical argument. There are two premises that are empirical descriptions of the world and there is a premise, that in this case it's premise three, that is of an ethical nature. It's an expression of a conservation ethic. Now, if you were appreciative of that conclusion, you might even think, yeah, that's probably most of the argument, maybe even all of the argument. That's, that's, that's what I believe, and that explains why I uh, appreciate that conclusion. The best way to critique an argument is to think about it from the perspective of somebody who disagrees with it. If you're, in particular, trying to figure out, well, is there a missing premise in this argument? You're more likely to find that missing premise if you take on the perspective of somebody who disagrees with the conclusion. Upon taking on that person's perspective, you would realize there's some missing premises. We'll make some space for them right here. And the missing premise would be this, would be that individual animals are valuable and they should not be killed. Obviously, this is another ethical claim, another ethical premise. It's an expression of an animal welfare conflict. So long as premise three and four are both in the argument, there will be some concern about the reliability of that conclusion. Now, if we're going to add premise four in there, and if we want to really shore up that conclusion, we need to add a little more space because there's yet another missing premise. and also, premise four probably needs to be elaborated on, elaborated upon a bit. That elaboration would be 
by adding these words without a good reason. So individual animals are valuable and they shouldn't be killed without a good reason. With that addition, then we would need premise five, which would be that protecting ecosystem health is a good reason to kill. If all those premises are true, it would seem that we're well on our way to supporting that conclusion. At this point in our analysis of this argument, I would like to draw your attention to the word valuable. It shows up twice in the argument in premises three and four. And when you read those premises, I'm sure you certainly get the general sense of what we're talking about. But we might also say, well, but more precisely, what does it mean to say, for example, that an individual animal has value? Value to whom or value in what sense? What I'd like to do is to rewrite these two premises, this sentence in particular, as individual animals possess intrinsic value, and this sentence right here to re-express that idea as ecosystems and species possess intrinsic value. In using the phrase intrinsic value, we are invoking a specific concept that environmental ethicists have developed and what we should do next is spend a little bit of time addressing the question what exactly are environmental ethicists speaking about when they use this phrase intrinsic value. Before getting into the heart of that concept I want to return to this ongoing comparison between ecology and ethics. We pointed out a little while ago that each discipline is characterized by tools that it uses. And now I just want to point out that each discipline is also characterized by its concepts. So ecology uh, makes use of the ideas of competition, fitness, resource selection, many other concepts of course. But to be a good ecologist you have to you know, have you know, a competent understanding of those ideas. Ethics is the same. It has its own concepts in addition to its own tools. Concepts like human nature duality, holism, and intrinsic value, many other ideas. For now, let's just spend a little bit of time thinking about intrinsic value. And, and what I'm about to share with you over the next several minutes uh, was presented in a journal that, or a journal article that was published in Conservation Biology in 2015. To understand intrinsic value, we can start thinking about a very simple object like a hammer. And we can ask, well, what is it that makes a hammer valuable? And, we, and we're just talking about the ordinary kind of go to the hardware store and buy a hammer, that kind of a hammer. Well, it's valuable for what it does. It's valuable for pounding nails. And if we break it or lose it, we can go and buy another one, and the value has been replaced. Hammers, like many objects, are useful for what it is that they do and we refer to that as instrumental value, sometimes we call this use value. We can contrast that idea with a child. And a child is valuable for its own sake. A child might do valuable things like mow the lawn or take the trash out or wash the dishes, but that's not what makes them value in the end. They're valuable for their own sake. They're valuable for what they are, not what they do. If we lose a child, we don't just say, oh, well, we'll get another one, and whatever was lost will then be replaced. When we lose a child, something irreplaceable has been lost. And this is the most important idea. When an object possesses intrinsic value, it creates for us an obligation to treat that object with concern for its interest. At the end of the day, that's what it means for an object to possess intrinsic value. No more, no less. Now that we know what intrinsic value is, and if we can just take the presupposition that all humans possess intrinsic value, the question that arises is what about the non-human portions of nature? Does that also possess intrinsic value? I'm going to address this question through a series of misconceptions because especially in the conservation profession, our understandings about whether nature possesses intrinsic value has certainly been uh, influenced by, by a number of misperceptions. And the first misperception is that, well, we shouldn't believe that nature possess intrinsic, possesses intrinsic value because to do so would be misanthropic. This simply is a misunderstanding of what the word means. A person could hate nature and love people, or a person could love nature and love people, and a person could love nature and hate people. Of the three types of people that I've 
drawn our attention to, only one of these types would be considered a misanthrope. It would be this last type. To be a misanthrope means that you hate people. That's all. And so long as it's possible for a person to love more than one thing at a time, for a person to love nature and to love humans, then it's not misanthropic to think that nature has intrinsic value or to care for nature. Some people believe that intrinsic value is not so easily quantified, which is absolutely true. And for that reason, it must be infinite. And if nature's value is infinite, well, that seems like a, a wholly unworkable concept and, and just not very useful. And for that reason, we probably shouldn't acknowledge nature's intrinsic value. This also is a misunderstanding, and we can clarify the misunderstanding with just kind of, of a simple thought experiment. We can ask the question, does the intrinsic value of a bear make it wrong for a person to kill a bear? Well, the answer to the question might depend on the context. For example, if the bear is about to eat you, and you have the opportunity to kill it just before it does so, you're probably not going to encounter too many objections from ethicists or anyone else about whether that was a, an acceptable thing to do. If the bear is about to damage your bird feeder, however, killing it is probably not the right response in part because the bear possesses intrinsic value and should be treated uh, at least in part for an interest in its own welfare. Another concern that people sometimes have about believing in nature's intrinsic values that they think that it's really just an idea that is extreme that really very few other people believe it and they tend to be you know ex extreme in their views we're talking just about people who would chain themselves to trees hippies vegans just uh, you know crazy outlandish folks this also is a misconception it turns out that about 8 out of 10 people believe that nature possesses intrinsic value. That's what the best sociological evidence suggests today. Some people think that it is inappropriate to believe in nature's intrinsic value because the belief is arbitrary, that it's like your preference for strawberry ice cream. You're allowed to have it or not, and there's no other reason other than just that you, that you feel that way. What I would like to do is outline for you some logic that has been proposed for why it is that some non-human portions of nature possess intrinsic value. In outlining that logic, I think it can demonstrate that it's not an arbitrary sort of belief. The logic runs something like this, and I'm going to use the letters IV as an abbreviation for intrinsic value as I trace through this logic. And the logic begins, what is it about humans that imbues us with intrinsic value? What is the trait that we possess that gives us intrinsic value? One answer to that question is that we possess certain interests, for example, an interest to avoid pain. And the logic, so it goes, says that anything else in nature that possesses that trait would also possess intrinsic value. And that means that mammals and birds would possess intrinsic value because they also possess an interest to avoid pain fish? The answer might be maybe. Part of the reason here has to do with the fact that the physiology in the central nervous system of a fish is sufficiently different from those of a mammal and a bird that some physiologists have some doubts about whether they experience pain, at least in the way that we're thinking about it when we think about a mammal or a bird. And also, when you start to get into the physiology of an organism that is so different, starts to press on what exactly is it that you mean by the word pain. It becomes a philosophical issue in part. Insects? No. Insects do not experience pain in the way that we mean it when we think about birds and mammals. And you might will say, all right, I appreciate that. Well, let's go back up to the second step in the logic. Maybe avoiding pain is not the interest that imbues humans with intrinsic value. Maybe it's a different kind of a trait. Maybe it's our um, interest to flourish. And if that's the interest that garners us with intrinsic value, then we can go back to the rest of the logic, especially starting with the fish, and say, well, yes, certainly fish possess an interest to flourish. And if so, then, and if that's the trait that matters, well, then fish possess intrinsic value. And even insects uh, have the same interest to flourish. And if that's the 
trait that imbues a thing with intrinsic value, then insects also would have intrinsic value. For whatever it's worth, I don't know of any philosophers that disagree with this line of reasoning. And it also, I think, demonstrates that um, there's nothing arbitrary about the belief. You, you, two people could disagree about the logic, and then they could uh, locate exactly what part of the logic they disagreed with, and then they could work through it and improve the logic and so on and so forth. But, but the ar argument is not, not arbitrary. Now this logic pretty straightforwardly gives rise to an animal welfare ethic. But think for a moment about species and ecosystems. Philosophers of ecology tell us that those objects don't possess interest. And if that's true, this line of reasoning would not end up with the conclusion that species and ecosystems possess intrinsic value. Now this topic of whether species and ecosystems possess intrinsic value, that's been of, of keen interest to environmental ethicists for the last 40 years or so. And one of the ideas that has captured their attention are ideas that can be attributed to Aldo Leopold. He argued essentially that we owe it to members of our community to treat those community members as though they have intrinsic value, to treat them with care and respect and so on. And Leopold also argues that all of the species that we share the planet with, all of the species that we share the landscape with, um, are members of the same community. And so by that kind of reasoning, we can uh, give rise to a conservation ethic. Some people are concerned about believing in nature's intrinsic value because they believe that the belief is moot that it doesn't affect how it is that we would actually conserve nature in the real world. And since we have disagreement about the belief in the first place, that it might be just best to let it set aside. I'm not so sure that the belief about nature's intrinsic value is moot. And to ins inspect the possibility, we can go through kind of a decision tree. We can start with the question, does nature possess intrinsic value? The answer could be yes or no. And I think it would have consequences, for example, in how it is that we define sustainability. If we're on the left side of this decision tree, and if we say that nature does not possess intrinsic value, then humans are the only thing that matter on the planet. And sustainability could be, I think, exploiting nature as much as we like, so long as we don't infringe on our future ability to exploit nature as much as we would like. On the other hand, if nature possesses intrinsic value, then sustainability probably needs to take that into account, which would cause sustainability to be something along the lines of exploiting nature as little as necessary so that we can have a meaningful and healthy life. Those two worlds that would result from those two views of sustainability would not be the same world. They'd be very different, I'm pretty sure. The difference would be, for example, as profound but as subtle as the difference between two justice systems where the burden of proof was shifted in one case from being guilty until proven innocent as compared to a system where we were innocent until proven guilty. If this topic about sustainability and how nature's intrinsic value affects our views on sustainability, if that's of interest to you, you can check out a paper that I wrote with my colleague Michael Nelson published in Bioscience in 2010. And so now we have compared ecology and ethics in two ways, both with respect to the tools that uh, characterize the two disciplines. And now we just made the point that these two disciplines also have their concepts. Uh, and if you're going to be a good ecologist, you have to have some knowledge of the concepts. If you're going to be a good ethicist, you also have to have some knowledge of the concepts that pertain to that discipline as well. Let's continue this comparison between ecology and ethics by thinking about ecological models. In particular, think about the Lacovolterra predator-prey model. Think about the equations that are associated with that model, and think about the predator-prey cycles that emerge from those equations. Now you know that no predator-prey system in the real world behaves that way. It's a, it's a pretty serious oversimplification of what's going on. But there's still something importantly true 
about that model and that's the reason why it is that a hundred years later we still or nearly a hundred years later we still teach this model to students of ecology we still conduct new research that pivots off of this basic model what we recognize when we think about Lacca Volterra predator prey equations is that all models are wrong but some of them are useful and that aphorism, I imagine you may have heard it before, uh, was expressed by a statistician whose name was George Box. He was a great communicator of statistics. George Box also wrote that since all models are wrong, that we must be alert to what is most importantly wrong, and that it is inappropriate to be concerned with mice when tigers are abroad. And I want you to think of arguments as being like models in exactly this way. When we look at a model, like for example the model that we've been looking at, the one that is trying to understand the conflict between animal welfare and conservation, when we look at that model it's not going to serve us very well to simply say, oh well that model just doesn't quite capture all that's going on. Instead, what we have to do is we have to say, well what is most importantly wrong about that model? And let's see if we can fix that or improve that aspect of the model. So in, in that spirit, we can start thinking about this argument in terms of the two forms of critique that I had mentioned before, thinking about missing premises, thinking about whether any of the premises are mistaken. But in doing so, I think we're going to have some challenges. And the reason we're going to have some challenges in asking these questions at this point in the development of the argument is because the argument is still expressed fairly broadly. It's still pretty general. It's about all invasive species. And this would be a little bit like imagine building an argument that tried to evaluate whether it is wrong to tell a lie. Well, there are so many circumstances in which you might imagine having to tell a lie. And in some circumstances it might be wrong, in others it might not be quite so wrong. It might even be the right thing to do. And so before we approach these questions, or I should say before we apply these questions to this argument, it will serve us to think of a specific case. And the specific case that I would like to think about is killing wolves in the name of caribou conservation. This particular circumstance uh, takes place in uh, Western Canada on the border of Alberta and British Columbia. In this part of the world, the circumstances are as follows. There's a population of caribou that are endangered. The wolves in this area are overabundant, and in being overabundant, they are uh, adding to the problem of the caribou. The wolves are overabundant because moose are overabundant. And the moose are overabundant due to habitat changes. And the habitat changes arise from logging old growth forest and arising from cutting down of trees for oil and gas exploration. And those activities are ongoing to this day. Let's keep this case of killing wolves in the name of caribou conservation in mind as we continue to analyze our argument. And to help us do so, let's take notice that many of the words in the argument are expressed in a, in a generic nature. So for example, we refer to invasive species. Let's take those generic words, the ones that I've highlighted here in blue, and let's replace them with words that are specific to our case. So for example, premise one would be wolves in British Columbia threaten ecosystems and native species. And premise four would be wolves possess intrinsic value. Now, let's think about whether this argument might not be missing a premise. Here's a good strategy for thinking about missing premises. The first part of the strategy is to recognize that if your intuitions lead you to think that this conclusion is probably all right, you'll be more likely to think that the argument is in pretty good shape, perhaps as is. The most potent way to uncover a missing premise is to take on the imagination of a person who you think is liable to disagree with that conclusion. That frame of mind is most likely to uncover what's missing. And of course think about the case that we have in mind and one of the things we learned about this case is that humans were responsible for the fact that wolves are so abundant in British Columbia. And so let's insert a premise, we'll call it premise 5, and the premise will simply say 
humans caused wolves in British Columbia to be overabundant. We'll inspect how that premise might affect the conclusion in a moment. But now what we'd like to do is shift our focus to the question of whether the premises are true. This is the other key part of analyzing an argument. And here I would like to take a, a kind of a pedagogical approach, if you, if you don't mind. And if we could just take for granted for a moment that all of the premises that I've marked with the green check, that they are just fine. We'll reconsider that proposition in a moment. But I want to focus on premise number two. This is in the spirit of focusing on, on the tigers, the focusing on the greatest problem within an argument. Premise two, the threat can be mitigated by killing wolves in British Columbia. One thing that's important for you to know about this case is that even advocates for killing wolves in this particular case don't think that this will be enough to protect caribou for two reasons. Some people think it's just simply not possible to kill enough wolves to make a difference. Other people are recognize that even if you took care of the wolf predation problem, there would still be a problem of lack of habitat for these caribou, and the lack of habitat ends up being tied to the uh, overharvesting of old growth forest. And so, premise number two is for this particular case simply not right. One of the important principles in argument analysis is that the conclusion takes on the properties of the weakest premise. And in this case, the weakest premise is premise two, which is simply wrong in this particular case. And that means that the conclusion is simply not supported by the argument. A couple of things to highlight here. It doesn't mean that the conclusion is necessarily wrong. It means that this argument doesn't support the conclusion. Maybe there's some other argument that support the conclusion, but not this one. The other thing that's important to know is, and I'll say it again just for the sake of emphasis, is that the conclusion takes on the properties of the weakest premise. And so the weakest premise is number two, it's simply wrong, and therefore the argument is not supported, period. We don't say, oh, well, there's six premises, and, you know, five of the six are, are true, and so the conclusion is mostly supported. It doesn't work that way. It's, it's really an all-or-none kind of circumstance. Again, in the sake of pedagogy, let's now suppose just for the sake of, of, of discussion, that premise two is correct. Let's suppose that we lived in a world where that was the case. Now what I would like to do is think about premise number six. This one is, is a challenging one. Protecting ecosystem health is a good reason to kill wolves in British Columbia. This clearly is going to be a judgment. It's going to be a value judgment. And you know, superficially or first glance, you might say, oh gosh, I mean, I have a view on whether that's the case or not, but I'm, I'm, I'm not really sure what's what could be demonstrated what that means again is that the conclusion takes on the property of the weakest premise and we're supposing now for the sake of discussion that premise six is the weakest one premise six is questionable we're gonna say and that means that the support for this argument or the support for this conclusion provided by this argument is, is also questionable what will you what do you do with a questionable premise one thing you can do is you can pretend like premise number six is the conclusion to some other argument that hasn't yet been articulated. And you, the task for whoever is up for the task is to then construct an argument that would help understand whether premise six is true or not. For the sake of time, we won't go through all of those fine details of assembling premises for this secondary argument. Instead, to help us understand what might be going on with that premise number six, I'd like us to imagine a dialogue between two people, one person in favor of killing wolves to save caribou and the other person opposed. And the person that's opposed might start off in their conversation, you know, humans are culpable, not the invasive species, and everyone knows that two wrongs don't make a right, and for that reason and under these circumstances, it's simply wrong to kill person on the other side would say yes but think of the consequences extinction you know of the caribou population that would be forever you can't come back from that and for that reason we really ought to be killing these wolves in the sake for the sake of caribou conservation now the person on the right is really focusing on the consequences of the decision in this is a reference to consequentialism which is one of the major frameworks for thinking about ethics 
in the field of in the discipline of academic ethics and the person on the left is invoking a framework known as deontology this is a framework that focuses on principles that what's right or wrong should be based on certain principles in this case the principle is two wrongs don't make a right and it's wrong to kill something when the thing you're killing wasn't to blame ethical frameworks there are depending on how you count them maybe between three and five different ethical frameworks in the discipline of academic ethics. These two particular ones have deep histories. Immanuel Kant is uh, in, uh, involved in kind of developing the basic ideas of deontology and according to this framework an act is said to be moral if it adheres to an inalienable duty such as a duty to be fair, to treat others with fairness. Consequentialism was developed by uh, Jeremy Bentham and another ethicist whose last name is Mills under this consequentialism framework, the consequences of an action are the sole basis for judging the morality of an action. Bentham is doing his work in the 1800s, Immanuel Kant doing his work a bit earlier in the 1780s. And now we're ready to make uh, this final comparison between the disciplines of ecology and ethics. In ecology, think for a moment about the difference between an ecological experiment and an observational study. And let's think of these as two different frameworks for developing ecological knowledge. Now we know that some ecologists are real strong proponents for one framework and others are really strong proponents for the other, but we know that if we take a step back, on the whole, both approaches, experimentation, observations, are very important for developing ecological knowledge. We also know that it takes some skill and some discernment to understand the relative strengths and weaknesses of both, if we could call them, frameworks. Ethics is no different. It has, depending on how you count them, maybe between three and five different ethical frameworks. And we mentioned two of them, deontology and consequentialism. And while some ethicists are real strong proponents for one framework over another, we know that in the real world, making wise decisions about what to do, making wise ethical decisions, requires understanding the relative strengths and weaknesses of both of these frameworks. Earlier in the presentation, we compared ecology and ethics with respect to the concepts that each discipline relies on. I want to spend just a few moments talking about an, another concept from ethics. It's the concept of a moral dilemma. When I use the phrase moral dilemma, I'm not referring to a situation where you're confronted with a decision and you're not quite sure about what to do or you maybe don't want to do what you know you should do. Um, maybe you just haven't thought through it uh, with enough care yet. When I use the phrase moral dilemma, I'm instead trying to invoke something a little bit more formal. It's a circumstance when ethical frameworks collide. For most decisions that we make in life, the different ethical frameworks lead to the same conclusion. So just f for example, if we think about a deontologist who's trying to understand whether they should follow traffic regulations, they would conclude that they should because it's the duty of uh, every good citizen to do so. A consequentialist would come to the same conclusion about traffic regulations because doing so leads to good consequences like not causing accidents and so forth. Moral dilemmas have been a source of great fascination for ethicists. They've studied them uh, a, a great deal, usually in the form of thought experiments. Uh, because it's uh, interesting, I'll share just a, a few moments of that. One famous and important thought experiment is the trolley car dilemma. It involves a trolley car that's racing down the tracks. It's about to uh, kill five people. and uh, But you happen to be standing on a bridge and uh, next to a person, if you push that person off the bridge, the person will die, but it will cause the trolley car to stop and it will save the five people that are further down the track. Now, ethicists have been studying this for uh, at least 30 years, this particular dilemma, and, uh, and there's a lot to be said about it, but in just kind of the very roughest sense, uh, deontological thinking leads a person to believe that they should not push the person off the bridge and consequentialist thinking leads one to believe uh, that you that you would push a person off the bridge. Now moral dilemmas are also uh, of interest to psychologists as well 
and to neuroscientists. And this is where there's this really interesting and complicated juxtaposition between science and morality. They come touching right next to each other in, in some fascinating ways. This question about trolley cars has been asked of many thousands of real human beings from various cultures and walks of life. And what we learn is that about 11% of people on the average would uh, say that they would push the person off the bridge. Uh, neuroscientists have also been interested not only in moral dilemmas but just moral reasoning in general, wanting to know what parts of the brain are engaged. And you know, one of the one of the most important lessons here is shown over and over again is that for normal human beings, for human beings that are not suffering from various forms of brain damage or you know kind of serious psychological problems, that emotions are engaged every time that we make um, moral decisions. So this business about the conflict between conservation and animal welfare, I think that it may be one of these genuine moral dilemmas. It's not the sort of thing where like, hey, you know, you believe what you think and I think what I think and that's kind of as good as we can do. I, I, I think it's uh, it may well be a genuine moral dilemma. And one of the things that we know about moral dilemmas is that they don't have satisfying solutions and that the best we can do is to take actions that prevent us from getting into that situation in the first place there's something frustrating about that lesson about moral dilemmas because for this case of animal welfare and conservation we have already find ourselves in that situation number one and number two collectively as, as a human race we're not probably always doing all the things we should be doing to avoid creating more of these situations in the future. Now I don't think that the conflict between animal welfare and conservation is always a moral dilemma. I, I think this is just often the case. You know, one example would be, and we saw it, would be this case where, um, you know, the killing is not expected to lead to meeting the conservation objectives. That blue text that I have written at the bottom of the slide, of course, that represents a premise that could, that would be in an argument. And if that premise is false, then I, I, th I think it would tend to undermine conclusions that lead one to think that it's, it's appropriate to kill in the name of conservation, in those particular cases anyways. Now when I invoke this premise, what's uh, frustrating and important here is that in many cases the premise won't be so simple as the killing will or will not lead to the conservation objectives. In many cases it'll be you know, we think it might or it could. There's the chance that it will uh, lead to these objectives. That we, you can work with that within an argument. You have, you're going to have a premise in an argument that is probabilistic. It, it makes uh, the rest of the argument a little bit more challenging to work with, but it can be done. And uh, but nevertheless, it's it's uh, aiming in some ways just to make a, a general point. Let's go back to that business about there not being satisfying solutions to moral dilemmas and that the that sidestepping them is the is the best that you can hope for there there might be a way in 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 some of these conflicts between conservation and animal welfare to sidestep it maybe in a in, in a sort of way to to understand what i'm saying i want to raise this idea of conservation triage which begins with the acknowledgement that um we can't conserve everything uh, we have too limited uh, financial resources and human resources uh, to, to do so. And so we have to just acknowledge in the beginning that some things are going to uh, not be conserved. And uh, we sh probably shouldn't waste our money and resources on those uh, species and ecosystems. And instead just focus on the ones where we know they'll be successful. Uh, when conservation triage is manifested in its most formal sort of way, it's, it's essentially kind of a, like a cost-benefit analysis where decisions are made on, you know, what's the benefit of saving the species? Usually in terms of like, is it taxonomically unique? Or is it an ecosystem that uh, has a really important function for humans? Or, uh, you know, this sort of thing. And on the cost side, it's, you know, how much will it cost to save the species? And do we, do we, can we afford that kind of money? And what's the chances of being successful? Those kinds of costs and benefits. I wonder if we can uh, just do a little bit better by expanding that calculus for conservation triage and think uh, a little bit more broadly, a little more frequently about what we might call morally sensitive conservation triage and to throw into the mix um, the, the, the moral costs and benefits of 
conserving or not conserving, and uh, and I, I realize that that uh, is not a simple answer, and it doesn't lead to uh, you know straightforward s solutions. But I think it, it it might be of some benefit to be a little bit more um, mindful in in this way. This uh, more or less concludes an overview of conservation ethics. We did some. Uh, you know, pedagogical things with arguments, and we also address some particular case studies. I want to leave you with two concluding thoughts. One is a final misperception. It, it's the misperception that ethical problems are impossible to solve, and uh, you know, it, it looks as though you have a certain view, and you're not really, you know, look like you're going to change your mind too readily. And I know I have my view, and I'm not so quick to change my mind. And boy, this just isn't worth our time to depend on these kinds of problems. I think the antidote to that is to recognize that ethical developments absolutely and assuredly are slow and difficult, but they are worthwhile. Um, in this way, it's not unlike science. Uh, one of the great questions in ecology is how do predators affect their prey populations? We've been thinking about that question for almost a century, and we still are not tired of, of contemplating it and making better answers for it. And, and, uh, and, and think of leaders of the civil rights movement in the United States in the 1960s. Thank goodness uh, they didn't succumb to this notion that this is too hard or impossible. They did not, for the most part, live long enough to see the fruits of their labor. And I, I think we might want to take the same kind of, of attitude. And that uh, concludes all that I would like to sh share with you today. Thank you so much for all of your time and attention.